Hi, uh, we truly live in interesting times, don't we? With multiple crises competing for our attention right now. The big one is, of course, climate change. But there's another crisis that might be almost as bad, and that is global biodiversity loss. So there's a difference. And this difference is in climate change, we know very well what's going on. So basic physics has been clear for over a century. So yeah, that one is pretty well understood, but not so biodiversity loss. See, in biodiversity loss, we don't even know yet how nature really maintains its diversity. And we have no ideas what can happen if we lose too many species. In fact, we don't even know how to measure biodiversity yet. And that is a problem that we discussed in a recent paper. You might think that in order to measure the biodiversity, we could just count the number of species in a system. And you would be right. This so-called species richness is one way to quantify biodiversity. However, often we are not so much interested in the number of species, but in the diversity of ecological functions that a system can fulfill. And measuring this functional diversity is more difficult. So there is a useful formula, and that is called Rao's Biodiversity Index. But in order to apply this formula, we need to be able to compare species. And that is where the problems start. Comparing species can be much harder than you would think. First, we have to know the species themselves. And for many important species, such as marine phytoplankton, we don't actually know them so well. But there's also a second and maybe more profound problem. And this problem is that we actually are not very good at comparing. See, it's pretty easy to compare similar things, like two apples, one apple and another apple. Well, we know how to compare them, right? Because we know what are the right properties that we need to compare. For these two apples, I might compare their weight or their price or their color. Yeah, these are meaningful properties to compare. But, you know, common wisdom has it that it's much harder to compare apple and oranges. If I compare an apple to an orange, I might still compare the weight, but it doesn't make so much sense to compare the color because, you know, origins always come in the same color. It's a kind of orange. So this is a problem when we compare very different things. We don't really even have a coordinate system to compare them. And the same thing is true for comparing different species. So how can we solve this? Let's consider the example of phytoplankton. There are literally hundreds of species which come in many different shapes and forms. Some are solitary, while others form colonies. But most importantly, they are adapted to a multitude of environmental conditions. To think about this, let's look at a simplified example, where instead of species, we have just symbols of different color and shape. The challenge that we face now is to find a way to accurately quantify the dissimilarity between any given pair of symbols. This is relatively easy when we compare similar symbols but it's much harder to compare a dissimilar pair. Take for instance the red and the blue triangle. Are these relatively similar because they are both triangles or are they very different because their colors are so different? Let's resist the temptation to compare apples and oranges for a moment and instead just focus on the most similar pairs that we can find in the set. In fact, let me indicate these trusted comparisons by lines in the picture. This creates a network but at the moment, it still looks like a mess. Let's rearrange things a little bit to clean this up. This way, it's much better, isn't it? We can also see some things now that we were unable to see in the original picture. For example, look at the red and the blue triangle. We can now see that they are very different. In fact, they appear at opposite ends of the picture. Now, that gives us an idea for comparing the similar pairs, doesn't it? If you want to compare the similar symbols, we can just measure the distance in the rearranged network. One way to do this would be to measure the shortest pass distance between the two network nodes. An even better way, which leads to less noisy results, is to use the so-called diffusion distance between the nodes, which takes all possible paths into account. This idea, the so-called diffusion map, was first proposed in a paper by Kaufmann and co-workers. They showed that if we have arranged our network properly, then we can compute this diffusion distance just as a line of sight distance between the respective nodes. 
Importantly, the diffusion map, that is, the procedure that's used to rearrange the nodes, is a simple deterministic mathematical operation that doesn't introduce any new parameters. So once we have decided for a network of trusted comparisons, we will get one result and one result only. Moreover, the method works with any number of dimensions, so we are not limited to rearrangements in the plane. We can also see now why diffusion mapping is useful for functional diversity. Suppose you took a water sample and you found only these four species. You can immediately see that the functional diversity is low because the four species are all very similar to each other. Now suppose you found these four species. Well, you still only got four species, but functionally they are very different, because the species are actually very dissimilar to each other. So once we have the diffusion map, we can quantify functional diversity by how much of the space is covered by the species present. And this is essentially what Rao's diversity formula captures. So combining diffusion maps with Rao's formula gives us a robust way to quantify functional diversity. So this sounds promising. But remember what I said in the beginning? For many species we are interested in, we don't know the properties too well. Say, if we wanted to apply this to marine phytoplankton, would this mean that we have to measure all the properties of all phytoplankton species and then somehow rank these properties against each other so we can kind of quantify the distance even between two similar species? Of course, if you know very little about the species, even very similar species can be almost impossible to compare accurately. Moreover, what we need to do is to compare the species not from our human perspective, but from the perspective of the plankton itself. What we really want is to quantify the dissimilarity of each pair in its ecological context. Surely computing such similarities based on the limited data that we have available is impossible, or is it? See, in classical ecological thinking, everything starts with traits that are morphological characteristics of the species. Due to the different traits, species have different functional capabilities that make it easier or harder to spread under specific conditions. Ultimately, a species' functional capabilities determine its pattern of biogeographic distribution that we observe in the environment. So in ecology, if we don't know the traits, we don't have a starting point for this line of reasoning. We literally have no ground to stand on. However, in mathematics, things are different. If you have an equation in mass, there's typically a way to turn it around. So does this help us in this case? Consider the following. If traits ultimately determine the species distribution in the environment, then this distribution must contain some information about the traits. It is reasonable to assume that species with similar traits occur under similar conditions. So species that are similar are likely to occur together. Now this idea gives us a way of quantifying the similarity between species without knowing their traits. If you have a set of samples, we can consider two species similar if they are abundant in the same samples. This is an interesting idea, but what about predator-prey pairs, right? The predator should occur together with the prey, and typically those tend to be not very similar species. And also, what about direct competitors, species that are so similar that one excludes the other, and so they are never seen together. Indeed, if we quantify the similarity between species by their correlation across samples, then the predator and its prey will appear more similar than they should. However, for the proposed method, this will typically not be a big problem. In a dynamic landscape, a predator and its prey are typically only correlated to a certain degree. When the predator reaches its peak, the prey is already on the decline. So yes, we overestimate the similarity between a predator and its prey, but even with this overestimation, their similarity will not reach very high values. Now recall that the diffusion map uses only the most similar comparisons. So any predator-prey comparisons are likely to be filtered out at this stage and won't enter the analysis at all. So what about competitors? Clearly, if two species exclude each other, they will be judged to be very dissimilar by our correlation-based metric. But again, this problem is fixed by the diffusion map. As the two competitors are judged to be dissimilar, the direct comparison will not be used in the rearrangement step. Instead, where the competitors end up will depend on their similarity with other species in the system. If our two competitors are very similar, also their similarity with other species in the system should be the same. And of course, this means that the diffusion map places the two competitors in the same spot. So for our functional diversity, 
it doesn't matter whether we find one of these species in the sample or the other one, which is exactly as it should be. I think to really put this to the test, we need an experiment. So a system where we can observe the species, but where we already independently know the ground truth of what the functional diversity is. To create a data set where we know the ground truth of functional diversity, we made a mathematical model. We randomly generated 200 virtual species that differ in their resource requirements. Each dot that you see in this diagram represents one of these virtual species. And the location of the dot represents the species need for three limiting resources. The species have been generated such that they lie on a plane in this resource space. So if a species needs less of one resource, it will require correspondingly more of the other two resources, modeling a resource trade-off. As a result, the species fill a two-dimensional trade space in the shape of a triangle. We then drop the species into a large spatial simulation, a virtual ocean if you will, where the species can disperse between different locations, compete against each other, grow and die. The virtual ocean is set up in such a way that the three limiting resources are provided at different rates at different locations. This setup typically allows all species in the simulation to survive till the end. The question is now, can we recover the trade space just by sampling the virtual ocean? So without using our knowledge of the ground truth? To find out, we take some samples and use them to quantify the similarity between species by the Spearman correlation of their abundances across a set of samples. We then use the diffusion map to arrange the species. And this is the result. The diffusion map detects that the trade space is approximately two-dimensional, and it also recovers the triangle shape. Let's compare the reconstructed trade space to the original. Identical species are shown here in identical colors. So we can see that not every species ends up exactly in the right place. There are some gaps now due to all the noise introduced by the simulation. However, we get the big picture right, with every species landing approximately where it should be. For each sample, we can also compare the reconstructed functional diversity from the diffusion map to the ground truth functional diversity that we compute from the original trade space. Plotting one of these quantities over the other in a scatter plot shows a very good correlation, which gives us confidence that the proposed method can really be used to robustly estimate functional diversity. So, now that we have convinced ourselves that this method works, why not look at some data? And here's some good news for a change, because biodiversity monitoring programs have already produced very large and extensive data sets that we can apply this method to. We consider a phytoplankton monitoring dataset from the Lithuanian Baltic coast. It contains data from 10 stations taken over a period of 23 years. When we apply the diffusion map to this data, it places the species into a multidimensional space. However, let's look just at the first two dimensions, where the largest variation exists. In this real data, we don't know the ground truth traits of the species, but we do know some environmental properties that were recorded along with the samples. We can use this information to work out the properties of the water in which each species was typically found. For example, if we color code nitrogen content, we can see that species that score high on the first axis of our reconstructed trait space typically come from nitrogen-rich water. So maybe these species are adapted to high nutrient levels, or at least to some factors that correlates with high nutrient levels, such as proximity to the coast. If we color code water temperature, we can see that species that score high on our second reconstructed trait axis typically come from colder water. So maybe these species are adapted to colder water, or maybe they are just the early species who reach their peak already in spring. Based on the diffusion map alone, we cannot test these hypotheses. But they could be explored with further data, laboratory experiments, or knowledge from the literature. Now finally, let's look at functional diversity. In this map, we have placed larger circles at stations where the functional diversity is higher. There's a clear pattern with less diverse communities out in the open Baltic, and more diverse communities closer to shore, where stronger spatial gradients exist. Perhaps more interesting is a trend of functional diversity over the 23 years of observation. During this period, all 10 stations saw a gain of functional diversity. The colors show that again, 
these gains are strongest close to the coast. This result isn't unexpected, as climate change causes an increased inflow of freshwater from the Coronian Lagoon, introducing freshwater species to the Baltic. It is interesting to note that the coastal station that sees the smallest increase is directly at the exit of the Coronian Lagoon. This station already has a high functional diversity in the beginning of the sampling period, with many freshwater species being present from the start. This explains why freshwater inflow causes a lesser increase in functional diversity in this place. In the Lithuanian data, we don't see biodiversity loss, but biodiversity gains. But what does it actually mean? Is this nature adapting to a new state in the wake of climate change? Or is this just the beginning of a longer development in which the new species will eventually replace the existing ones, leading potentially to greater losses? We don't know right now, so I guess there's more work to do. Thank you very much for watching.